talking about the major basic stuff of clinical microbiology as well as getting an understanding of why is clinical microbiology important and why is it something that if you guys would like to study it's it's actually quite fascinating um so for today our objectives are going to be very simple we're just going to look at the role of microbiology in disease control uh, we're going to look at the methods of specimen collection and storage which are extremely versatile they're varied depending on the specimen depending on the patient depending on the specific uh, illness that we're looking at so we're just gonna do a kind of a once over slight overview of those and then we're also going to look at some of the conventional testing methods in the clinical laboratory um and then okay percy that's my dog he's um uh, you know throwing his foot as i told you he would and then uh, we're going to just uh, quickly look over the BSL levels, just kind of to gain an understanding of what the clinical lab is all about. Um, so why clinical microbiology? What is the importance of clinical microbiology? If you look back in time, infectious diseases have killed more people through human history than all wars combined. They are the ultimate killer. And we have this arms race with bacteria and you you will be listening to the news and you're going to hear, oh, there's this new bacteria that has evolved this and that and they have gained this resistance to antibiotics. And this is why we have such a huge problem with antibiotic resistant bacteria. So we have several uh, different gears, as I like to call them, that work together. And this is epidemiology, the treatment and contingency measures and pathogen and identification. And they all work together. Um, in what would be the large scope of things uh, in, in, science, in science just to gain a sense of what is that is causing the disease, um, how do we treat this disease, and how can we prevent this disease from spreading in the future. So the first step of any um, outbreak, the first step that we must take is identify what is the pathogen that is causing this disease. And for this, uh, we will be looking at some of the different um, things that, that, that we take care of when we're going through pathogen identification, which is going to be specimen selection and handling, specimen testing, and then we're also going to look at the BSL levels in this, in this uh, category. So starting with pathogen identification, um, we have the specimen selection and handling. And we're going to break this down based on the type of infection. We have parasitic infections, we have viral infections, we have bacterial infections, mycotic infections. And then we're also going to take a quick look at media and appropriate sampling. So for this, let me, oops, are you guys seeing this well? Okay. Um, yep. And then switching here. So uh, starting with specimen selection and handling for parasitic infections. Uh, for parasitic infections, uh, basically what we do in the lab is what is called an OMP, an OVA and parasite uh, testing. And these OVA and parasite samples will um, basically be mostly poop, but uh, also sputum or blood depending on the infection that um, is suspected on the patient. So parasitic, um, the samples that we're going to be looking at um, will depend specifically on what the clinician says. And then our job as clinical laboratory scientists is going to be determining whether or not uh, the sample submitted has been appropriate and then conduct the testing that we want from there. So common parasites uh, seen in the lab also depend from the location of the lab, for example, if you're living in the United States, it is extremely rare for you to see uh, things like uh, huge uh, tania infections, um, which are more common in underdeveloped nations. So those are kind of things that you know exist, but you may not normally work with on a daily basis. Whereas if you have a clinic in a very underdeveloped country or region, or even rural areas, you may see those infections more. Um, when we get samples for uh, OMP, we will be looking at getting concentration techniques. Uh, so basically, get, we get um, 
the sample and we centrifuge it and, and then we we'll suspend it. Just trying to get the sample concentrated as much as possible to increase the chances that we will be able to detect the eggs or or even parasite pieces in the sample. Um, it is also very important, and this is something that gets missed a lot when it comes to parasitic infections, is that parasites don't shed at the same time. The parasite shedding rate depends on the parasite, and sometimes you have to collect more than one sample at the time, like over a, a period of time. And then you also have to make sure that the patient is not taking antimicrobial agents because those will uh, most definitely the like, reduce uh, the amount of shedding or re even impede you from detecting these things in the in the sample. So next, we're gonna take a look at our viral infections. Uh, viral infections uh, should be collected always as early as possible. And uh, we like to say that you want to collect them before the symptoms start, but that's quite impossible because if you don't have symptoms, why would you go to the doctor in the first place? But there is a small window where the specimens may be collected and they're usually done so as early as possible. The type of sample that the clinician will collect is going to directly depend on what type of virus is suspected and the time of the year. So, for example, if a patient is presenting with uh, cold and flu symptoms during flu season, they are going to likely be tested for influenza. Whereas if they present with those symptoms in a different time of the year when influenza is not prominent, they're going to be expected to have some other type of disease. So the testing will be depending on that. When we collect um, those samples, it's important that they're processed immediately. Viruses don't have as much as a shelf life as other pathogens. So it's important that they're either uh, refrigerated at minus four or just frozen at minus 70 if they're stored for more than four days. Uh, you never want to do the minus 20 because the crystallization in the cells would literally kill the virus. And then you do have different types of, um, of, of sampling that you can do with viruses. You have, and, and those are dependent on the virus as well. So for urine specimens, you usually do those for the mumps and rubella, which I wish we did not have to test for anymore, but sadly, you know, people are allergic to vaccines now, apparently. Um, you will see fecal specimens for rotaviruses and noroviruses. And then uh, there's uh, this thing called the sanctineer, which is used for the chicken pox. It's sort of an impression of the vesicle where um, so the characteristic vesicles of the chicken pox, you just lift the, the cover of the vesicle and just make a, a, um, a smear of the fluid inside. And then you have the nasopharyngeal specimens, which are usually done for influenza viruses. So moving on to our next one here, we have uh, bacterial infections, which to me, they're one of the most fascinating groups because they're so broad and so varied. You have so many bacteria and you have bacteria that are normal flora in your body and they may become pathogenic under different circumstances or they may just decide to uh, overgrow because of change of pH in your body and, and the consequences can be quite devastating. So for me, they're very fascinating. The collecting um, of bacterial samples is also going to depend not only on the infection that you're in, in the times and symptoms, but also on the site. Um, if you have subcutaneous infections, it's very likely that you're going to be dealing with an anaerobic uh, bacteria, which means that you have to be extremely careful, not only in your collection of the sample, but also on the uh, transport media that you're gonna be using so that the bacteria survives when it gets to the lab. And we have specific instructions that we have to give not only the collection uh, people, but also the technicians working in the lab just to make sure that the bacteria don't die because if they die before they get to the lab, then we're going to get a ne negative result and we're no closer to finding out what's wrong with the patient. So we have to select the correct anatomic site to collect, to collect the specimen. Uh, we have to follow the proper technique. As clinical scientists, we also have to make sure that we're able to discern from what's going, growing in a plate of what is normal flora. So what do you expect to grow in that plate? If you're taking a sample from skin, 
it is very common that you're going to have some form of staphylococcus or streptococcus growing in your in your plate if it wasn't um, properly sterilized and the aseptic techniques were not observed because it's normal flora and it's literally everywhere. It could be the patients, it could be the person who collected it, it could have been picked up in the transfer. So these are kind of things that when you see growing on a plate, you're going to be looking closer at the type of infection that the patient is presenting and thinking, well, is this the type of thing that a staphylococcus infection would be giving us? If it is, then we might want to look closer at the staph and isolate it. But if it's not, then you want to kind of just brush it up and think, okay, this is contamination for normal flora. Um, so another important thing is that you always have to label not only the patient information, but you also have to label the site. And this is something that as uh, laboratory scientists, we have to also check for when we receive samples, we have to make sure that the collection method, the site and the patient information all matches so that everything is uh, tipped up shape, like I would say. So um, next, we're going to look at our mycosis. Here we go. So mycotic infections, well, to me, fungi, they're my favorite. I love fungi. Um, this may be a little more because they're, you know, they, they're causing diseases, but they're so pretty. Like, look at this. Look at this guy. Um, just absolutely beautiful under the microscope. So when we look at mycotic specimens, uh, you can receive literally anything for a mycotic specimen. It can be a piece of hair. It can be a nail. It can be um, a, a skin scraping. Um, but what we're usually looking at is, hi. That was my hope. So what we're usually looking at is uh, we're going to be looking at the specimens and we're going to be giving them some type of treatment because what we want to see is the actual fungi growing on the specimen. So we're usually going to treat the samples with some KOH, which KOH is designed to uh, basically just dissolve the keratin on the sample so hair and skin and nails all have keratin you're just going to dissolve those and then that's going to leave you just with those with a raw sample um you also have some other types of stains that we use in 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 the mycology lab which are going to be the india ink which is very common for the cryptococcus and then you have gm sign copper for white um you also i we find very useful the fluorescent lamps there are some fungi that will fluoresce quite literally when you put them under the woods lamp. And this is very useful for infections such as uh, malassezia fur fur. They will, they will glow when you um, look at them under the lamp. And that's kind of a dead giveaway when you see that. It's just like, okay, this is this is a fun gum infection. This is what we're looking at. Um, once we do prep the samples though, uh, we will uh, look at examine the sample directly for the organism and the the clinical scientists are going to memorize and be able to discern these organisms based on their morphology. So things that we look at are the macroconidia, the microconidia, and then we're going to look at the patterns and arrangement of these and how they just relate to each other and just kind of like I, I, I compare it to just ident identification by like memory. You just look at a thing and just like, oh, this is this. I know this guy. I, I'm friends with this guy, kind of. All right. So that's basically it for the fungi. Um, well, it's not basically it. There's so much more, but we're not going to go as much in detail in you know, what is specimen selection and collection and all that. I want to keep uh, the class kind of fun and just look at the diseases and that stuff. Um, so when we look at media, the variety of media that's out there is just absolutely insane. Um, I have, I think I have um, in my notes, I have like possibly like five or six pages just on media describing different types of media and what they do and what they don't do. And it's just kind of too much to cover in this lecture. But, um, what I do want you guys to understand are like, the different types of media in the classification. So you have selective media, and these are media that contain some type of inhibitory, um, inhibitory chemical or, or additive or um, or stuff like that that will uh, make one of the types of organisms not grow in there in that plate. So one major example of this is McConkie agar. It just selects for gram-negative bacteria and inhibits uh, gram-positive bacteria. 
This also is a differential media. So differential media are going to contain agents that will react to a biochemical property of the organism that is growing there. And it's going to give you some type of indicative that you will be able to use as a positive or negative. So for example, in McConkie, this is lactose fermentation and organisms that are able to um, ferment lactose are going to be yellow. So these are the things that we look at. When we look at selective and differential media, every clinical lab is going to at least, at the very least, play on BSA and MAC, just because it, we, we don't really play on NA, on, on just uh, regular uh, nutrient agar, because it doesn't really offer us much in the department of selection and differentiation. But when, it, uh, when we do play it on these two, we're able to see, okay, did it grow on, on, on MAC? Yes, it did. It's, it's a gram-negative organism, so we can move, move on from that. We also have the transport medium, and these are especially useful for fastidious organisms. What we call fastidious organisms are uh, what, I like, what people call dramatic. They will die very quickly or just not grow if certain conditions are not met within the plate. So a very prominent example of this is Bordet Gengu auger, which is used for Bordetella species. And uh, Bordetella is what causes the croup. And you will see when a patient is suspected of having this, they will be, the sample will be collected at the bedside and played it directly into the transfer media just because the organism is so fastidious and will die so quickly if you don't do that. So <clears throat> what is appropriate sampling? Um, as I was mentioning a little earlier, uh, scientists, your job is not just to, to make sure that, or test the sample, but you also have to make sure that everything matches. So labs will be receiving an insane amount of samples in a day, and you have to make sure that the paperwork that comes with the sample and the sample all um, matches. And it is very common for you to turn away sampling samples just because there's a piece of information missing from the paperwork that is included in the test tube, or or because you receive double samples for the same patient, which is likely an indicative of mis uh, mislabeling on the paperwork. You also have to be um, you have to be able to prioritize your samples. Um, different samples and, and different tests have different shelf life, basically. Uh, if you have something that is uh, coming from amniotic fluid or CSF. And those are critically invested in invasive and you want to treat those as fast as possible. Then you will look at taking care of the unpreserved samples, which uh, will be uh, bone, drainage from wounds, feces. And then after that, you will look at quantification, uh, which will be the catheter tips, urine, tissue, quanti quantification. And then after you've already checked those off, then you look at the things that you have preserved. And these will be like thesis in preservatives, your implicit preservatives, and swabs that are in, in transport media that allow you to basically just wait a little bit longer before you take care of those. Anywho, here we go. Um, so when it comes to specimen testing, um, you know, back in the day, you had this um, medical lab scientist that would grow stuff on their plates and sniff the plates and be able to tell you what it was growing. There are some organisms that have very distinct, very unique smells, uh, such as like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, which smells very fruity. I don't know, I've never smelled them myself because we don't sniff plates anymore. But it is something that they tell you, and they still describe these things in the books, which I find very fascinating but today we look at other methods of testing um we look at molecular testing we look at culture we look at staining we look at biochemical testing protein-based tests and we're going to take a, a closer look at those in just a second so for molecular testing methods the most common thing that probably you guys will think about it's okay pcr and yes this pcr has been just completely revolutionized the lab just being able to amplify a small piece of dna and test for it is it's so advanced and we're so good at doing that right now um the test is not without its uh, limitations i remember we were having a conversation about this in discord just uh, i want to say maybe like three weeks ago about how PCR cannot diagnose 
uh, COVID. And I was like, well, yeah, but not, no tests out there can diagnose anything. Um, we, as scientists, we look at the data and we look at results and we make critical evaluations of what these results are. And based on the results and based on the symptoms of the patient, we are able to make a diagnosis. So advantages of PCR is that it can amplify small amounts of DNA and it's very useful for non-culturable pathogens. There are some pathogens out there that are in fact so fastidious or so delicate that we cannot grow them in the lab. Um, it does have its limitations, which is it doesn't offer you an insight into the disease state. Um, you could have uh, bacteria, you could have had a bacterial infection in your body and you treated it with antibiotics and the bacteria is dead so you don't you no longer have an active infection but if you do a pcr on your sample it is still going to show positive because the bacteria are dead but they're still there they haven't degraded quite yet um you also have uh, to be careful because pulse results may occur specifically when we look at bacteriology we as i discussed previously we have this whole issue where we have so many organisms that are already normal flora that when you amplify, it's very hard to distinguish just in light of PCR whether or not we have an active infection. Um, then we have also been able to modify some uh, the PCR process. We have real-time PCR, multiplex PCR, which are just much more, more advanced ways to look at the samples. So looking at the next one here, culture. Culture is by far what I like to call the gold standard for most uh, pathogen ident identification processes. Um, when we look at bacterial uh, infections or when we receive a sample for bacterial testing, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to do a, a gram stain on our sample. And we're, gonna to, we're going to determine if it's a gram positive or gram negative organism, just because that is the first an easiest way to determine in which direction we're going to go. If we have a gram negative organism, then we're going to be looking at doing some oxidase tests to make sure that we have, um, well, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself because we're gonna talk about biochemical testing in just a second. But anyways, we use the bacterial culture uh, to isolate organisms and to be able to make sure we have a pure sample before we proceed to biochemical testing. In the viral lab, uh, we have different ways that we can culture viruses. We have cell lines that are finite, low passage, or continuous, and these are used to culture viruses. And then what we look at is the cytopathic effect that these viruses have in the cells. Um, viruses are very unique in the way that each virus will have its own cyto cytopathic effect. And by seeing the way that these they distress the cells, which is literally what cytopathic means, like the way that they damage the cells, people, we're able to identify which virus is in question. In the mycotic culture, we have a slight problem when it comes to, to fungi. Fungi grow extremely slow. Even the ones that we call fast growers take days to grow, which can be a little problematic in the lab. Because if you have something like a systematic, systemic infection or the patient who has uh, problems, respiratory complications, you want to be able to make that differential diagnosis as early as possible. And culture may be a way to confirm, but you want to be able to have something else to give your uh, physician ahead of time. So here, our next uh, step here is biochemical testing. Um, this is actually a CIA on the picture. Um, which is actually kind of a differential media, uh, or I don't know why I put that there with biochemical testing, but uh, ignore me. I did that probably not thinking. Uh, so for biochemical testing, we have a huge variety of tests that we can run. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, we will um, observe uh, if we have a gram positive or gram negative organism and then move from there. If we have a gram positive organism, the next step for us, it's always going to be a catalase test. Just because the catalase test breaks down the gram-positive organisms in strep and staph. And that is a huge advantage because once you know if you have a strep or a staph, you can follow up with the next appropriate test. And then if you have a strep, you can go ahead and, and, and look for their, their hemolytic characteristics. 
on on sheep blood agar and that will be able to help you that will help to narrow down what type of organism we're looking at when uh we have gram negative organisms our next step is going to be the oxidase test which is very useful for identifying members of the enterobacteriaceae family and then uh, for example just to throw one out there if you have a, a gram negative bacteria that is also oxidase positive you're going to be looking at doing an indole test and a urease test and that will tell you if you have a um an e coli or a klebsiella pneumonia just kind of to give you an idea of, of what we the, the steps that we follow uh, these things are all charted out um, you, as, as a clinical scientist you're expected to know this flow charts and, and this workflows for identifying different pathogens another very useful one is lactose fermentation which can be done uh, by planing into lactose media and observing if the organism will break down the lactose or not such as lactose fermentation you also have <coughs> the breakdown of different sugars and, and different chemical reactions that can be observed, uh, such as <coughs> hydrogen sulfide production. And um, so another useful method is staining. As I was mentioning earlier, we look at the gram stain, but there is also a variety of stains that you can use. There are organisms that will not stain gram positive or gram negative, or they will be very misleading when you gram stain them. So we have developed different types of stains. We have gram stains, the gram stains, acid fast stain, and just an insane amount of different types of stains that we can run on organisms. And this will be dependent, again, on the workflow and what we are expecting from this particular um, disease state or, or patient. Uh, next, we have the protein-based testing, which has indeed revolutionized the way that we look at diseases but this is based on antigens and antibodies um we have elisa which um, you guys most of you will be familiar with uh it is a very common um test that you can use to determine whether your substrate has a certain oh, i'm sorry whether your sample has a certain has antibodies to a certain disease you can engineer this antibodies and have them in your microplate to react with the patient's uh, antigens or antibodies. It's quite useful test. Um, you also have fluorescent antibody staining, which can which it uses an antibody link fluorophore and can help you determine the presence of surface antigens. This is very useful for fastidious organisms. And then lastly, you have mass spectrometry, which I am not an expert in mass spectrometry. I remember looking at my mass spec. Um, results and, and just completely be baffled. So I gotta really understand what's going on here. But again, I never really paid much attention to it. I probably should. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if you guys were um, present for the conversation we were having with Jen and she was talking about how she was gonna be working with a Molly Tough machine. And I was like, oh, that's so exciting. I have no idea how to work one of those. Um, so, anyways, um, moving on here. Um, so, we looked at how we handle these organisms, but the most important thing is safety. As I was mentioning before, uh, before we had the days when uh, the scientists would sniff the plates and the pipetting was done by sucking on a little tube. Those days are behind us. We don't really do these things anymore. Um, what we do do is follow the very strict code of BSL levels. Um, you have BSLs one through four, and they are increasing, they go from low risk to high risk. And on BSL-1, um, it's probably what you would observe in uh, probably like an undergrad lab, unless you're working on research on the side. I don't really know if you guys do anything higher than BSL-1, but as far as my undergrad, when it was all pretty mellow, just normal sterile techniques, uh, nothing pathogenic, just regular E. coli. Um, when we look at BSL-2, then we start having some limited lab access. You're going to have biosafety cabinets. You're going to have little risk of aerosol transmission. You're going to be looking at organisms that are a little bit more pathogenic or dangerous, such as HIV and staphylococcus, which can cause really, really dangerous infections. We will look at uh, the wide range of things that staphylococcus does in our gram-positive lecture. Um, when we have BSL-3, when we move on to BSL-3, 
we're already starting to look at having negative air pressure in the lab. Um, there's going to be a risk of transmission by inhalation. So you want to make sure that the pressure is going out so you don't really have the pathogens flying around in the lab and then the lab space. And these are going to be organisms such as mycobacterium tuberculosis and Western Nile virus. Lastly, we have the BSL-4, which is um, the most dangerous stuff. It's, uh, these are going to be the organisms that you do not want to come into contact with under any circumstances. You're going to have all the previous, um, all the previous the methods of care. And then you're also going to be looking at having a complete isolation. And um, you're going to have pre uh, positive pressure uh, suits required. So you want to make sure, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I just read your message. Everybody loves fungi. Yeah, fungi is awesome. Um, so yeah, and then these are going to be like Ebola uh, viruses, which we know are extremely deadly and they need to be treated with extreme care. So how does this tie in into the big picture? What is, what is this all, what's the, the grand meaning of all of this? Um, we have um, uh, the clinical microbiology lab is, is just essential for determining the epidemiology of certain diseases. And then it also helps in understanding the trends of disease, such as flu season, pinpointing outbreaks and, and times such as the Ebola outbreak of 2014. And then, it, it all works together rather serendipitously to make sure that we're able to keep up with the arms race of viruses. So uh, viruses and microorganisms, bacteria, um, fungi, and all that good stuff. So who's this guy in the slide? This is Jon Snow, not the one from Game of Thrones, but the real one. And he is considered uh, father, the father of epidemiology. And he was responsible for discovering the source of the cholera outbreak in London in the 1800s. And he traced it back to a crank in one of the water wells. They, mind you, back then had no idea that it, cholera was caused by a bacterium. Uh, they, they just knew that it was a disease, it caused diarrhea, and it used to run in communities. So this guy did a lot of testing and, and, and looking at the things that these people had in common and traced all of it back to that one crank. And by removing that crank, he was able to stop that whole epidemic, which is quite fascinating if you look at it in the scope of the time, it was the 1800s, go imagine. But anyways, we have different levels of disease state that we look at. Um, you have endemic diseases, and these are diseases that are always present in the population at a low rate. A good example of an endemic disease would be uh, dengue fever in the tropics, for example. You have an epidemic uh, state, which is a high frequency over a short period of time. A good example of an epidemic uh, well, they refer to the opioid, the opioids crisis as the opioids epidemic. Um, I guess that could count, but opioids is not technically a microorganism, so we're going to call that. And then you have pandemics, which are occurring over a large geographical area. And pandemic, it's what we're going through right now with the um, COVID-19 virus. We are in a global pandemic. Um, so what does this mean? What is the, how do we use this information? So we use the information that we collect from the clinical lab and we tie it in with the epidemiological studies and we use it to develop treatment and contingency measures. The treatment strategies are going to be de dependent on antimicrobial susceptibility testing, which is something that we also do in the clinical lab. For example, a patient can show up with uh, symptoms of, an, of a very common infection, but they're not responding to the usual treatment. At this point, the physician is going to ask us to test for um, different types of, of um, antimicrobials and see if the organism is susceptible or not to those antimicrobials. So this is very important to the treatment of disease because you don't want to keep treating a patient with a with a with the antibacterial that is not working for them because basically just growing the uh, strength of the immunity of the pathogen against that specific antimicrobial. You're going to be looking at patient isolation techniques, which is a very critical part of avoiding the large spread of disease. And then you're going to look at adjusting your safety measures.
when we look at the sea surveillance, we have a huge, huge problem with globalization. You have air travel, you have overpopulation, you have the ability to go from one corner of the world to another corner of the world in a matter of a day, which was something that was completely unprecedented before. But it is, as much as it is nice for us as humans to be able to do this, it is also extremely dangerous because you can literally travel with a virus and a disease and just take it to another continent overnight. And this has its own ramifications. You have to be careful with isolation. You have to be careful, uh, careful with patient tracking, which was very critical in stopping the Ebola pandemic, the Ebola epidemic of 2014. I will link up later a documentary on that Ebola, Ebola epidemic, which I have referred to quite often on this lecture, I just not realized. But it is very fascinating how they were able to um, not only stop the spread of the disease, but to control the disease within the area, namely after it went completely out of control. Um, the, it had to get to a, a, an insane level for the officials to, to say, okay, this is enough, we have to do something about this. So this is basically how it all ties together. Um, as a short summary here, I have uh, put down a few key points. Uh, for you guys uh, that basically just cover what we have talked about over the lecture. And right now, I am just going to open it up for you guys. If you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and jump into the voice chat with me. Any questions? Oh, I see someone. I don't I just wanted to say thank you for the lecture and it was great. I didn't have any questions. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I feel like I ramble a little sometimes. Like I can get off topic a little bit. No, you, you stayed on point the whole time. It was very good. <laughs> All right, thanks. Anybody has any comments, things they would like to ask. Well, you guys are welcome. You guys are welcome. I think, uh, Kaka, were you able to? Kind of fungi gang for sure. It, uh, why is mycobacteria called mycobacteria? It does not resemble fungi. It is, it is a bacterium, not a fungi. Um, as far as I know, it's just a classification they gave it because of the diseases that they usually cause. Um, the most common types of uh, mycobacterium that you're going to be looking at are usually going to be mycobacterium tuberculosis and uh, mycobacterium leprae, which causes um, lepra, which I find to be a fascinating disease just because we don't really know how it transmits. Um, we, it used to be a huge problem back in the day. Um, you had all these leper colonies and, and people living together with leper, but it has sort of kind of fallen into the background of things and it's not as common anymore, but we still don't know how it transmits. And I, to me, that's terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. I can get you a copy of the media. Um, I just have to start through it. I don't know if I have a digital copy. I know it's on my big uh, binder. I have two binders full of bacteriology stuff, and they're both about an inch and a half. They're pretty huge. I just have to sort through it, and as soon as I have it, I'll post it. 
then yes, the biochemical test. I do think I have um, digital copies of those. Those are really useful for the micro lab. I used to draw those incessantly, just sit down on a whiteboard and just draw, draw, draw until they became second nature to me. I will post this as well. Is it usual not to be able to write notes in time? Oh, I'm sorry, was I going too fast? I, I may have been speaking a little fast. The lecture should have lasted for an hour, but it only was like 20, like 40 minutes, so. You guys are welcome. I enjoy it as well. I haven't taught anything in, I want to say, like four years. Three, no, that's not true. I used to teach a lot when I was in the park, but yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, definitely. I I feel like the the clinical lab skills are very important. It's a field that needs a lot of people. We're extremely short staffed, and we have all these great medical techs and and medical scientists that are retiring. They're leaving the field already, and and we don't really have enough new people in the field to keep up with the demand. It's a very high demand. Very well paid job if you guys are interested to pursue it further. I will post the lectures. So if you guys want to look back at the, um, at the stuff, I will post the PowerPoint. And then as soon as Kako has the recording, we will upload that to the uh, BioCord server as well. If Kako has it. If not, I will record it on my own and repost it later. Anybody has any more questions? I guess like the only question I would have is looking at what we've talked about with staining and rec like when you are isolating a, a pathogen uh, that can cause illness in a human body. Uh, mm -hmm. The methodologies for finding the cure for the pathogen uh, what is that like? Do they involve like more movement of the pathogen? Like, do you like add sunlight? I mean, what's like the the magic cure for like all diseases? I guess. I mean, if cholera was isolated to a water, a dark water pipe, what would be the opposite mm -hmm. of that? Um. So we don't really have a set formula for. Most of the things that you see in the clinical lab today, we already have cures. It is extremely rare for us to find um, a, a new pathogen per se, and it would have to be like today with a with a virus, with a with a COVID nineteen virus that is a new mutation, and it throws the world like, okay, what is this? Um, there's a, for example, uh, this new um, yeast called Candida auris, and it is uh, just a variation of Candida albicans, but it is extremely resistant to all microbacteria, micro, um, antimicrobial agents. So this makes it a huge problem because it causes these organisms cause a normal disease state, um, but they cannot be treated normally like other organisms would. So when we encounter organisms like this, the procedure is going to be isolation, which you do through culturing methods. You're going to um just grow it test different things see okay does it grow on on this plate does it grow on that other plate um what does this mean what what does this mean for this organism in particular and then from there you're going to do biochemical testing to further isolate and well today we can do nuclear testing we can we can literally trace the genome of the organism and be able to tell okay so this is in this family and then you're going to do antimicrobial testing on that organism to see what works uh, what can be used to kill it and from there, you develop a, a treatment plan for the patient in, in question, um, depending on the severity of the disease. Um, we may not be able to help the patient in time. Um, if we're talking about a bacteremia, which is an infection of bacteria in the blood, the time that it may take to isolate and determine what organisms are 
uh, or uh, determine what antimicrobials are going to be deadly to this particular organism may not be fast enough for us to be able to save the patient. I hope that answers your question. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else has any other questions? You can poke at me. I don't know everything. I'm just a postgrad, not specialist, but. Is there a sample collection procedure for prions? Uh, yes, it, it's called do not touch them. Um, the, <laughs> so when it comes to prions, is prions are so deadly and they're, <laughs> yeah, no touching, don't, don't go. So you don't wanna go poking for prions until you have exhausted all other possibilities. You're going to test for literally anything under the sun before you do a specific